forms were distributed at the signing table. Your comments are very important to the planning committee and will be used to plan future programs. As you know, all sponsors of CME are required to execute a conflict of interest policy. Speakers are expected to disclose to the audience any real or apparent conflicts of interest that may have a direct bearing on the subject matter of the program. Dr. Steinman disclosed that she has no, no relationships with commercial supporters that could be perceived as a conflict of interest in the context of this presentation. Dr. Susan Steinman is Professor of Surgery and a Trauma and General Surgeon at the Queen's Medical Center and Director of the UH Hyperbaric Treatment and Wound Care Center. She has led the UH Hyperbaric Treatment and Wound Care Center for the past year and a half. She was a Regent Scholar at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine and completed her general surgery residency at the University of California Davis. During residency, she did a two-year research fellowship in the mechanisms of shock and sepsis at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California. She came to Hawaii in 1996 to pursue a fellowship in surgical critical care. Dr. Steinman has served as Director of Surgical Medical Education for 13 years and Interim Chair of the Department of Surgery for three years. She is the current Chair of the American College of Surgeons Committee on Medical Student Education and immediate past President of the Association for Sur Surgical Education. Please help me welcome Dr. Steinman. Thank you so much. It's a, a real honor and pleasure to be here today. I, I will have this presentation available for all of you online. I just have to get rid of the, the copyrighted photos. Um, I, I really appreciate the introduction. And what we're going to talk about today is a, a, a kind of a mix of hyperbaric oxygen as it's relevant to the geriatric patients you may see, and also a little bit about wound care. So my disclosures again, no commercial support, um, but I do work at the UH Hyperbaric Center, which is right downstairs, and also the Queens Medical Center, and those are the only two institutions in the state that have hyperbaric uh, chambers. Uh, but I would say that I was not always a true believer in hyperbaric oxygen, and as I've learned more about it, uh, I've really become to uh, recognize its uses and also its underuse really here in the state, so I'm hoping to give you a little of that information. Uh, what we're going to talk about a little bit today is the mechanisms of action of hyperbaric oxygen, which we'll abbreviate as HBO, uh, common indications, some of the principles of, of wound care, and also the patient experience for hyperbaric oxygen. And I am uh, the mother of teenagers, so I am used to being interrupted, uh, ridiculed, and ignored. And so I'd like this to be a very form informal presentation that will make me feel at home. Please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions about anything. So hyperbaric oxygen is really just the medical use of oxygen at a level higher than atmospheric pressure. So if somebody asks you how much pressure are you under right now, uh, you may have a variety of answers. It probably wouldn't be that you're under 760 millimeters of mercury or 14.7 psi. But this is the world that we work in in hyperbaric medicine. Um, and at one ATA, which is what you're at right now, is also equivalent to 33 feet of seawater. So if you start to read or hear about hyperbaric treatment protocols, uh, it can be a little bit confusing, but just recall that one ATA is standard normal baric pressure. And if you hear about treatment profiles to 33 or 66 feet per seawater, the hyperbaric chamber doesn't actually go anywhere. It's just an, a, an acronym for how much we pressurize the chamber to. So hyperbaric oxygen just basically works to either crush bubbles of harmful gas, which is what we do for patients that have nitrogenous dive accidents, and also, and perhaps more importantly for all the applications, the medical applications, is it really hyperoxygenates the tissues. And uh, this is just your simple uh, high school chemistry, and sorry for the bad flashbacks if you guys remember that high school chemistry class, but it boils law which uh, says that the volume of a gas is inversely proportional to the pressure. So we actually uh, kind of shrink the oxygen molecules and allow oxygen to diffuse into more body tissues than it normally can. Uh, it increases the oxygen in plasma and also increases the diffusion of oxygen. Um, also, the uh, oxygen will be at a higher uh, pressure within the lungs because it's uh, 
both 100% oxygen and a higher pressure. So in essence, the hyperbaric oxygen is just really pushed, pushing the oxygen out to the lungs into the tissues. Um, so if I ask you, what is the you know the, the uh, cardiac index of, of a blue whale, which is actually exactly the same as your cardiac index, normal cardiac index is three. So if you're looking to ways to increase oxygen delivery, um, oxygen content is typically the way that we do that. And when I was a fellow in the ICU, that the equation on the bottom is the arterial content of oxygen in the blood. And we were always told to ignore this part on the, on the right side, which is just the amount of oxygen dissolved in plasma. Because in the normal, normal baric oxygen conditions, this amount is really irrelevant. And it's mostly just the oxygen down to hemoglobin. But under hyperbaric conditions, we can dissolve a lot of oxygen in the plasma. And this part of the oxygen content, oxygen delivery equation becomes uh, important. So to illustrate it graphically, uh, the amount of oxygen dissolved in plasma at, at seawater is very small, but with hyperbaric conditions, you can dissolve 2% uh, volume increase with each ATA and really increase your oxygen delivery about 20-fold under a hyperbaric condition. So this was illustrated quite elegantly by Dr. Eddie Gorma, and he was a surgeon, and I would, you know, uh, as we surgeons all think that the surgeons are the coolest, coolest guys, and he certainly was a pioneer in his, in his field. He so believed in the, the health benefits of hyperbaric oxygen, that he actually used to operate in a hyperbaric chamber. Am I getting... Internet access here? Oh, okay, you got my <laughs> And he did an experiment where he took pigs and basically exsanguinated them and gave them an exchange transfusion with plasma, uh, which is, you know, would put any normal animal in normal bear conditions into, it would, would kill them pretty rapidly, but he put them in a hyperbaric chamber and he demonstrated that pigs without any red blood cells could survive and run around and be quite active at three ATA in, in a hyperbaric chamber. Um, he transfused the pigs again with their red blood cells and they went on to live the remainder of their lives and, and make bacon probably. But I thought that this was a very elegant demonstration of how um, much life can be carried in hyperbaric conditions. So how, you might ask, you know, how does intermittent hyperoxygenation promote healing? Because obviously you can't live in a hyperbaric chamber the, the whole time, uh, and it's usually just kind of given in pulse doses. So I think it's kind of analogous to your Thanksgiving dinner in that, uh, you know, you have this big meal, and oh, that we wish the effects of that went away when we finish eating, but it doesn't, you know, it kind of hangs around and, and either makes you feel very full or sometimes makes you fat, and hyperbaric oxygen is kind of the same way by, by feeding the, the tissues, it incites a variety of immunologic and, um, and uh, effects that carry on long after the oxygen is, is turned off or you're out of the chamber. So I'll kind of go through this basic science part kind of uh, quickly, but please do interrupt me if you have questions or if you need more references. So it's back to your side, and you know this because there's many bacteria that don't survive in aerobic conditions. They just do anaerobic conditions. Staph aureus um, also is killed more rapidly in, in aerobic conditions. Uh, synergy with antibiotics. And particularly the uh, aminoglycosides, etc., cetera, clindamycin, the penicillins are synergistic with, uh, in, in hyperbaric conditions. It enhances leukocyte function. You need a certain amount of oxygen tension for optimal leukocyte uh, function, and in sometimes damaged or radiated tissues, this does not exist. And so hyperbaric oxygen can help enhance white blood cell function. It uh, activates superoxide disputase, so it has the uh, dual benefit of, of, of kind of, even though it's healing and it inactivates uh, superoxides, it also has an anti-inflammatory effect. It induces plasma-derived growth factor on uh, endothelial cells, and this is an electron microscope of the induction of uh, PDGF with hyperbaric oxygen. Uh, it inhibits a sequestration of neutrophils and venules, it is one of the few things that can really promote bone growth. And uh, this is just a kind of fuzzy graph that's showing the alkaline phosphatase production by uh, 
bones in vitro in hyperbaric conditions. And uh, interestingly, and very creatively, it mobilizes stem cells. And we see this both in vivo and in, I'm sorry, in vitro and in vivo. And if you take uh, diabetic patients undergoing, real, real patients undergoing hyperbaric oxygen therapy for their diabetic ulcers, and you can measure their uh, nitric oxide activity um, and circulating stem cells, you'll find that this increases with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, neovascularization uh, in animal models and also in, in vitro, we can see actually new uh, small vessels and capillaries grow and that can be demonstrated angiographically. And uh, also, uh, and finally, fibroblast and collagen production. And this is, this may be, uh, this is a very helpful uh, tactic for wound healing as well as it's, it's wound healing is dependent upon fibroblasts and collagen. It also, I think, it may have sprouted uh, the, some of the off-label use of hyperbaric oxygen because everybody kind of wants these, uh, the younger, more youthful appearance with the collagen, um, but it, it does also have a beneficial effect on wound healing. The uh, primary national society for hyperbaric med medicine is the UHMS, and if you're more in, if you're interested in this science, I would highly recommend going to this website and looking through. They have a list of indications. Those indications are also listed on the pamphlet in the back. Um, but a, a wealth of information, frequently asked questions about hyperbaric medicine. They uh, publish a a textbook that comes out every few years, and they just published the 14th volume of this of hyperbaric oxygen indications. Uh, Medicare pretty much derives their indications and their criteria directly from these UHMS indications, so I'm going to discuss a few of these just briefly. So um, first off, as I mentioned, I, I would say that hyperbaric medicine maybe, or hyperbaric oxygen maybe, has had a bad rap um, because a lot of people have adopted it or kind of these off-label or fringe uses. It, it was rumored or actually demonstrated that Michael Jackson used to sleep in a hyperbaric chamber. Uh, and even uh, elite athletes like uh, Djokovic, top seeded tennis player, crawls into a hyperbaric oxygen pod after his matches to help his body recover. And I, I can't deny that there's some science behind that, but um, it, uh, I mean some theoretical science behind that, but it, it hasn't really been proven in sports medicine. But I think this is, it, these uses have somehow um, maybe tainted the science underlying hyperbaric medicine. Um, it also is not topical oxygen. So this is a, putting the foot in the chamber, unfortunately, doesn't work. This really has no effect. The oxygen's got to come in through the lungs, goes out through the blood vessels to the tissue. And these soft chambers, and, and I apologize for that picture of myself up there, but um, <laughs> the, the soft chambers are also not effective. So you may find if you uh, go on a web, uh, some practitioners um, it, out and about uh, who have purchased a soft chamber, but the pressures in here, thankfully, can't achieve a, a pressure that's significant to derive the benefits of hyperbaric oxygen, and they also aren't allowed by fire standards to flood the chamber with pure oxygen. So what are the indications, primary indications is arterial gas embolism, and hopefully you won't ever see these, but it does occur in the hospital setting, it can occur with things as innocuous as central venous line placement. Hyperbaric oxygen is first line therapy for arterial gas uh, embolism. The treatment for AGE, I think when I first was in medical school, they told you to put the head down and roll the patient and you could never remember, do I put them on the right side, do I put them on the left side? You can just keep them supine um, and, and give them high flow oxygen and then basically call us the hyperbaric center because it's first line emergency treatment for AGE. Uh, radiation uh, it is great in the short term for patients with cancer, and we've seen a lot of a lot of cures, particularly for head and neck cancer, prostate cancer, with radiation therapy. But just as in the radiation that that occurs from uh, UV light, and I put this up here to, uh, just to kind of illustrate. Uh, reportedly, my kids tell me that. that um, John John Florence and Taylor Swift were actually dating at one point. She is the older one, but he's been out in the sun a little bit more, and you can decide for yourself who has the, the older looking skin. Um, but just like radiation, UV radiation in your youth causes long term damage, so does radiation from radiation therapy. 
And unfortunately, that damage often gets worse over time, so that the patients will get through their cancer treatment quite swimmingly and then realize the effects of radiation on the soft tissues and bones um, six months and on down the line, and oftentimes that, that progresses. Some of the delayed effects of radiation therapy include soft tissue and bone necrosis, and that includes things like osteoradial necrosis of the mandible, um, soft tissue necrosis of the head and neck. We see um, cystitis, not infrequently, that's, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, proctitis, and then some of the more severe manifestations that are rare. Radiation cystitis, so my guess is that you've probably seen this in your patient population. It, it is often a, a mild form presenting with nocturia, frequency, or urgency, uh, but it can become very severe in progressing to hematuria. Uh, these patients will generally go back to their urologist, uh, which, is, which is a good idea. Unfortunately, the urologist uh, ha, it, is kind of limited in what they can do to help this. They'll often try intravesical therapy, which is not very effective most of the time. And then oftentimes the next step is to go in with the cystoscope and cauterize the, the bladder. And if you think about it, since the pathogenesis is from radiation damage, damaged, friable, bleeding tissue, if you go in there and try to cauterize everything, you're probably not uh, going to be able to address the underlying problem very well um, because it's such a diffuse problem and it's based upon uh, the quality of the tissue versus just one or two of the bleeding sites. So, and this can be bad enough, though, if it persists, that the patients can need a complete cystectomy, only conduit, urinary diversion. So hyperbaric oxygen uh, it is a treatment, uh, an adjunct treatment to this, and it's shown to be effective in about three-quarters of the case of uh, radiation cystitis with hematuria. The 25% that don't respond tend to be those with uh, long-standing gross hematuria, but if we catch it early, sometimes we can have a good effect. Radiation proctitis, another uh, entity that is seen frequently following uh, prostate cancer radiation. And again, sometimes it's, it's minor and self-limited, but hyperbaric oxygen has been shown to improve quality of life and symptoms with that. Um, Osteoradial necrosis, we actually see quite a bit of this uh, because head and neck uh, cancer is, is a frequent entity for radiation. Radiation causes a fibroatrophic effect on the bone and the soft tissue, it's hypocellular, it's hypoxic, it's hypovascular. And uh, even it, without overt osteoradial necrosis like you see here with the fistula, um, a lot of patients will have damage to their mandible from the radiation that's not visible overtly. And if they undergo dental procedures, and it can be as simple as dental extraction following radiation therapy to the head and neck, they run a fairly high risk of having osteoradial necrosis. So in the seminal trial, the Marx trial, Looking at this, almost uh, close to a half had issues with dehiscence of the wound, uh, delayed healing, and then wound infection. And those statistics could be dramatically cut by treatment with hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, prior to and also for a brief period following dental surgery. Um, we see quite a few of these patients, and perhaps maybe one of the reasons is it's, it's coming on the radar more is that um, you know there have been cases of lit litigation for patients that were not at least offered hyperbaric oxygen therapy for uh, uh, before and after dental extraction. Um, and this is a famous case that, that, that played out before where a man had a relatively low dose of radiation, 66,000 uh, centigrade, uh, and then had dental extraction developed ORM and successfully sued his dentist because he was not offered hyperbaric oxygen. Um, it wouldn't be a surgical lecture unless I, have, unless I had at least one slide that made me go ew, and this one is at the Clostridium myomicrosis. So as I mentioned, the effect of hyperbaric oxygen on, um, on, on infection and leukocyte function and the bactericidal activity is also a great adjunct for some of these necrotizing soft tissue infections. We have to get to these early to have a good effect. Refractory osteomyelitis is another indication, and typically we'll, we'll look for these higher grades of stage 3 and stage 4 osteomyelitis um, that has failed to respond to initial debridement and therapy, and it can be used as an adjunct to surgical therapy and antibiotics. Likewise, um, sometimes the osteomyelitis is in an area 
where debridement is not possible, or it would be excessively morbid, or maybe the patient's not a good surgical candidate. In, this, in these settings that we can use hyperbaric oxygen uh, with antibiotics alone without surgical debridement and often get a uh, good effect. So in both the pediatric and the geriatric population, it may be primary therapy with antibiotics. A uh, threatened flap or graft, and we see this in the surgical realm, but you may also see this in, in some of your hospitalized patients, um, crush injuries or reimplantations. Uh, if we are able to get to these early, as you might expect, the oxygen can diffuse out to the tissues and, get, uh, and help keep flaps or grafts alive that might not, not otherwise live. Now, this is not a, a geriatric patient, obviously, but a, a fairly dramatic case of how this works in action. Um, this young lady who was a victim of assault with both of her ears. Um, and, and normally, looking at this as a surgeon, I would be very pessimistic that she would get any kind of reasonable cosmetic function back. But um, shortly after having that, had her ears implanted, she started hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So it was able to keep these ear grafts, which are not particularly vascular structures, alive just through the diffusion and the oxygenation, which I thought was pretty dramatic. Other indications which you may run across um, central retinal artery occlusion. So uh, again, this is something that we need to treat fairly early. It has to do with the oxygen diffusion to the areas of the, um, of the, of the where the retinal artery supplies. As you know, there's no other great effective treatment for central retinal artery occlusion. I think in the emergency medicine textbooks, they talk about massaging the eyeball or other things that are usually not too fruitful. Um, but this does have a, a, a good response to hyperbaric oxygen. Um, hopefully you won't see too much intracranial abscess. Idiopathic sensory neural hearing loss may respond and treat it early. Uh, burns and, and anemia is not something that Medicare will cover, um, but it, it, there is some data to support using it. Now, ongoing research has to do with inflammatory bowel disease, some traumatic brain injury, and particularly for things like ischemic pouchitis in, in centers like in Minnesota where they see a lot of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, there is widespread use of hyperbaric oxygen as an adjunct to surgery or when surgery uh, has complications. Now, if, if you're a clever person, you may be thinking, well, you're talking about hyperbaric oxygen in, in these patients that are cancer patients, and that makes me a little bit frightened because I know that uh, since hyperbaric oxygen causes angiogenesis, um, and angiogenesis also occurs in cancer, are you not uh, perhaps increasing the patient's risk for recurrence or uh, accelerating the malignancy? Um, well, the good news is that it, from in vitro studies, it appears that most of the mechanisms of angiogenesis from hyperbaric oxygen and cancer are different. So it's a different cellular mechanism. And most of the patient population studies have shown that uh, cancer is not accelerated in some time. And some folks have even used it uh, hyperbaric oxygen as an adjunct to immunotherapy or forms of chemotherapy, that day is still not ready for prime time yet. But suffice to say that it doesn't appear to um, accelerate cancer. I, I don't, shifting uh, gears a little bit, I don't need to tell you all that we have an epidemic of diabetes here in, in Honolulu um, or here in Hawaii. Uh, prevalence is approaching 10%. And it's estimated that at any given point in time, there's at least um, 500 patients walking around, uh, or not walking around, depending on their ability to ambulate, diabetic patients with chronic leg wounds. You're familiar with the pathogenesis, it's basically diabetic neuropathy, they have a bit of minor trauma, have an ulceration that can result in faulty healing, gain reading infection, and ultimately end up with nobody's favorite operation, which is an amputation. So if I asked you which condition is associated with the highest annual mortality rate, stage three breast cancer, diabetic foot ulcer, grade one month old, unstable angina, or base jumping, um, if you're savvy, you know, because it's a, a lecture on diabetic foot ulcer, of course the answer is going to be diabetic foot ulcer. But just to, to hit that point home, you know, if, if your patients aren't going to take care of their feet, they might as well put on a squirrel suit and jump off a cliff because it's actually safer than having a one month old diabetic foot ulcer. The mortality from that is 11%, and if you add that, particularly in the geriatric patient population, if you add, if they uh, progress to amputation, that can almost be a death sentence because you're going into the realm of, of less mobility. Um, Five-year mortality uh, is, approaches 50%. The risk of non-healing is dependent both upon the age of the ulcer, 
the size of the ulcer, um, weight and grade has to do with the depth of the ulcer, and these risks are all um, additive, additive. And so the ADA has made a statement that any wound that's unhealed greater than four weeks is a real cause for concern. Um, the good news is, is that with adjunct hyperbaric oxygen therapy, you can flip the statistics. So instead of having somewhere from a 70 to 80 percent non-healing rate uh, with good comprehensive wound care, you can flip that and you can heal the majority of lower extremity diabetes foot ulcers. This is a patient uh, that that I saw uh, kind of early on in, in my hyperbaric experience. And as a surgeon, I looked at, I took one look at this and I said. It's a, that foot's got to come off. There's no way that's going to heal. Um, but lo and behold, with uh, a little bit of debridement, basically hyperbaric oxygen, I, I, when she came in and it was bleeding in that upper right hand slide, uh, we all said, Yay! I mean, she was horrified that her foot was bleeding, but we were all amazed that she was able to get enough blood flow back to the bleeding. She went on to heal this, this ulcer. Um, it is, make no mistake, that the hyperbaric oxygen is part of a comprehensive wound care program. So it does not work uh, in a, a vacuum or a chamber all by it, itself. And there does need to still be the attention to the tenets of wound care, surgical debridement, um, topical wound care, and particularly vascular assessment and making sure that the big blood vessels are working, nutrition and offloading. And you can see, and we see patients like this, like you do too, um, with difficult issues regarding offloading and nutrition and wound care. Some of the challenges I'm sure that you all have experienced, and I do as well, uh, in the geriatric patient population is that they're really predisposed to having wound problems, to, both to getting wounds and then having problems when some wounds arise. There's less water content, tensile strength in the skin. There's atrophy of the glands, which leads to dry skin. Um, they have uh, uh, decreased vascular supply uh, often, and compounding that, it may be harder for a geriatric, uh, for a geriatric patient to do the topical wound care and the offloading and everything else is part of the comprehensive wound care. Um, just to point out a, a few tenets of the wound care, so debridement, um, again, as a surgeon, just bringing this up. So debridement does not necessarily just need to be done only by surgeons, but if you're going to do debridement, um, and you can do debridement with water irrigation, you can do blood debridement, um, but you do want to make sure you're not debriding when there's no blood flow, and that you know what you're looking at when you're debriding, and also, you know, uh, something like this comes in my office, and I immediately go, yeah, I just want to get rid of all that dead stuff, um, which actually, for this patient, would have been the wrong move, because it's probably in the game, and you make it a little bit worse. Um, one of the components of vascular assessment can be very simple, done in your office, just an ankle brachial index, uh, which can, all you need is kind of a Doppler probe and a blood pressure cuff, and we do this routinely on our patients referred for wound care. Uh, a fancier and perhaps more helpful assessment of, of uh, oxygenation of the tissues is transcutaneous oxygen, transcutaneous oxygen measurement. Um, and it's done by a special machine um, that attaches probes uh, and a semi-permeable membrane and electrolyte solution. And really what it does is it measures the oxygen uh, that, that gets out to the skin. If you've ever worked or seen a neonatal ICU, sometimes they'll have these for CO2 or PO2, and we also use them in the wound care realm. Um, it's been shown that with a, um, with a TCOM, a partial of a pressure of oxygen that's less than 40 millimeters of mercury, those wounds can be predicted to have poor healing. Um, and we will use it as a challenge test by giving the patient oxygen and seeing if their vascular supply is sufficient to increase the O2 in that wound. We'll do it both outside the chamber and inside the chamber and really be able to predict uh, more scientifically which patients would be expected to benefit from hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, infection and chronic inflammation, uh, again, the hyperbaric oxygen can help that. This is pretty much a clinical diagnosis. Wound cultures don't help that much, and sometimes it just takes a seasoned eye to know that the wound's not getting better if something else is amiss. Um, we'll talk a little bit about moisture balance, which is some of the things that we do at the, the wound center as well. Um, we don't want it too wet. We don't want it too dry. Uh, it's got to be um, uh, an addressing should protect it, allow some gas exchange, and provide a moist environment. 
anybody that's that's um, kind of been in the wound care realm know that there is a, a, a plethora of agents that can be used, and a lot of them um, with a variety of costs um, and a variety of mechanisms of action. So I, my suggestion would be to kind of pick something that, that you like and it's relatively cheap and, and kind of stick with it. In terms of enzymatic debridement, um, I will use often meta honey for, uh, for, for patients um, that, that whose insurance doesn't cover sample. Some patients like the prescription stuff of sample differently. And then just um, uh, aquaphor, hydrogel, to keep the wound moist if that's needed. Uh, here's a little graph that I sometimes refer to, but you can also really just kind of look at the wound and decide from what dry degree of infection, degree of contamination, what a good choice of dressing would be for that. Edge effect is something that we work with in hyperbarics and, and, and really in surgery as well. And it, the, the concept is how do you get the, the skin to, to grow in? What can you do to improve healing once you've taken care of infection, once you've assured vascular, the vascular supply of the large vessels? Um, and there's a number of things we can do to ease that. Um, one is uh, apply biologic agents. And there's really some fairly good synthetic grass that can be applied both in the office setting and in the operating room setting that can provide coverage. And this may be a good option uh, particularly for some of your patients that don't have the resources to do a lot of daily wound care. Just like a split thickness skin graft, these can go on um, and kind of stay on for a number of days and would be amenable to less frequent dressing changes and provide some coverage for the wound. And eventually it will, it will lice, um, but usually there's this fair degree of normal data skin healing that goes on during that process of the, of the graft lysing. You're probably well familiar with wound backs as well. Uh, works by bringing in the edges of the tissue and also increasing capillary ingrowth and taking care of bacteria. Um, this can be challenging in an outpatient setting. They do have portable, uh, portable devices, but you can get some dramatic results with this. Um, you may not know, and I didn't know for a long time, there's an international skin care advisory panel. I've gotten very interested in skin care because I've gotten very old and I get these things myself and it drives me nuts. Um, so they have a, uh, do have some suggestions out there, uh, both on how to prevent, which you all probably know better than I do, but also how to treat uh, skin, skin tears, uh, classifying them as uh, little skin loss, partial skin loss, or complete skin loss. One of their suggestions, which I really like, is make sure if you're going to put a dressing on one of these skin tears, flat scare tears, to uh, show which way the next person that changes that dressing should remove it so that you don't pull it off in the wrong direction. Um, I find these very challenging sometimes uh, to get to healing. And I, I will usually, um, I will oftentimes tack them down with a very fine absorbable suture like a Fibo, Monocryl, or something like that. Um, scary strips are, are not a good option here. And as you know, um, you can dress them, but then they're oftentimes left with a large defect as well. It takes a long time to heal in this population. So getting the flat back over early is a good thing as much as possible. Um, Dr. Baynosa, who, who wrote this uh, manuscript, was here just, just recently and gave a, a little talk. He's a plastic surgeon. Um, and I thought that this was interesting in the use of hyperbaric oxygen for what basically is a very complex skin tear, which is a, a threatened flap to, to a certain degree. So this is a case, and you may have seen something that's nasty, and, and I actually have also, um, that you're just kind of put your hands up and say, what are we going to do with this? This lady happened to be on uh, steroids and had sarcoidosis in addition to diabetes and suffered this, this, this type 3 skin tear, which looks a little ominous at first glance. Um, Dr. Reynosa and his team did what everybody should do, and you kind of straighten out the flap and try to get that down and then uh, applied a hyperbaric oxygen and a, a skin substitute and got actually a pretty good healing uh, in the time span of a few weeks. So it's, this uh, made me start to think that if we do have patients with challenging, it's not for every skin tear, obviously, but for uh, something that might be challenging that maybe the hyperbaric oxygen after, with the skin tear, skin tear being a threat to flap would be a reasonable thing to do. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about the patient experience for hyperbaric oxygen. And, and, and hyperbaric oxygen is not a new concept. In fact, um, there were chambers being built uh, in the early 1920s, and you can see in 1928, and it was actually probably a good thing that the stock market crash uh, ended this, this chamber's viability before it, it went up in a big fire because you can see they weren't very attentive to all the fire safety that we have now in our regular chambers. But it would look pretty, pretty tony, I thought. Um, this is our multi-place chamber. We're actually undergoing a renovation to digitalize a lot of this pretty soon. Um, but we're the only multi-place chamber downstairs in the whole entire um, state and really even out to, to Guam. In the multi-place chamber, uh, the, hundred, the oxygen is given by a hood, much like an astronaut hood. Um, the chamber is flooded with air, and there's always an in-chamber care provider, a nurse, um, or a specially trained um, technician that is in there. Um, we also provide uh, availability for emergencies. Um, the elective hyperbaric oxygen treatments are usually two hours per day, and they run through Monday through Friday. Emergency chambers such as our multi-place chamber here downstairs are becoming increasingly rare. Uh, and here's a, a, a quick look at all of the hyperbaric chambers in the U.S. And I guess they didn't consider Hawaii to be part of the U.S., but there you go. Um, and there has been a lot of proliferation of hyperbaric chambers, in large part due to the treatment of diabetic wounds. However, the number that provide emergency uh, care are vanishingly small. And the next nearest emergency chamber is in San Diego, California. So you can see that that's not a good option for your patients that need emergency care and you put, put them up in an airplane. So um, I, I, I've come to the opinion that it's very important that we keep our emergency facilities here alive in, in Hawaii, um, not only for the diet patients, but also for the all the medical uses as well. Um, monoplace chambers, which I showed you a picture of briefly, which is what they have at Queens Medical Center, are another option for patients and sometimes it's patient preference. Um, the differences between the two are kind of listed here, but uh, in brief, for the multiplace chamber, you have, uh, you can accommodate more patients, you can accommodate sicker patients, they, so they can have medical devices, that external fixator, the patients can be sitting up and they can even stand, so it, for the sicker, Patients who may be kind of position limited um, or have things like osteoarthritis necrosis where they don't want to lie down, it, it may be a better option. If they have difficulty equalizing the pressure in their ears, having that in-chamber care provider is oftentimes a great asset to be able to work with them to equalize the pressure and tolerate the treat treatment. Um, the patients in the multi-place chamber um, will talk with each other, uh, even play cards, uh, read a book. Uh, monoplace chambers do have the TV outside the acrylic, so that's what they draw I think, for the monoplace chamber. Contraindications to hyperbaric oxygen are very limited, and I would say that I, uh, I, I would put a patient in a hyperbaric chamber that I would never in a million years take the, to the operating room. Um, because you're really just giving them oxygen, and there's very few things that oxygen makes w worse, and a lot of things like heart disease and oxygen makes better. And I must say, anecdotally, I'll have patients come out and say that their 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 sore knee seems so much better, and, and they really they, it, it's rare that I operate on somebody and they feel better after my surgery. Um, and sometimes appendicitis, but not right away. Uh, but almost invariably, the patients kind of feel better coming out of, of the chamber. And, and really, they don't feel worse for the most part. So really, the only contraindications are very severe COPD or bullous disease, and that's because of the risk of having a pneumothorax or um, chemotherapeutic agents that act directly on, uh, on the lungs. The side effects uh, of hyperbaric oxygen are fairly minimal and rare, but the main one is really barotrauma of the middle of the ear. So just as in scuba diving, if any of you are divers, the patients need to equalize the pressure through a valsalva maneuver or something like that through the eustachian tube to equalize the pressure when the, the chamber is pressurized. So we spend quite a bit of time working with the patients, teaching them how to do that, and making sure that they're able to um, equalize the pressure. Uh, claustrophobia is pretty rare in, in my experience. Uh, if they can get in an airplane, typically they'd be fine in the chamber. And like I said, having a care provider in is very helpful. Um, there is such a thing as the, the, the um, oxygen-induced myopia as part of the toxic effects of the oxygen. Um, that is short-lived, stops when we take, stop doing the hyperbaric oxygen. 
Um, and then also seizures are another very rare side effect, which is treated in a multi-place chamber very easily by taking the patient's hood off, so you remove the oxygen and usually things will come to resolve. And again, pneumothorax is really the only absolute contraindication. So um, in summary, and thank you for your attention, uh, I would like you to remember and consider a hyperbaric oxygen and even a wound care consultation for any flaps or grafts that you have at risk. And I would say in the geriatric patient population, if they do get a skin flap or, or a graft, um, they're often going to be by, by limitations of vascularity at risk. Um, any non-healing wound really greater than four weeks old. Um, I will say parenthetically that unfortunately pressure ulcers are not an indication for hyperbaric oxygen. That's not so much that the oxygen wouldn't uh, help, but the thought is that the main pathogenesis for pressure ulcer is just as as in its name, and pressure. So um, offloading becomes paramount in pressure ulcers. But if the patient progresses to get a flap or graft or a plastic surgical procedure, then it may be an instance where hyperbaric oxygen may help. And then all types of radiation induced tissue damage. So any patient that's had a history of radiation more than six months prior is really at risk to develop these, these problems of proctitis, cystitis, or if they ha have to undergo dental procedures at risk for osteoarthritis necrosis. So thank you for your attention. I would welcome any questions either now or later. Anyone on Zoom? Yes, so um, HMSA uh, mirrors Medicare quite closely in their indications. All of the indications that I presented in longer form are covered by Medicare. There are some um, stipulations with regards to the duration of the wound. So for instance, with the diabetic lower extremity wounds, uh, they have to be older than, than about four weeks and they, with a trial of uh, usual wound care. Um, same thing for uh, osteo, Myelitis, it has to be a bit unresponsive to usual therapy, and it wouldn't be for small bone. But everything that I talked about today is pretty much covered by um, Medicare. Yeah, so um, I'm glad you mentioned nursing. Nursing home does create an issue with the reimbursement because those are bundled payments. So unfortunately, for outpatients, no problem. Um, if they're in a skilled nursing facility because the payment is bundled to the SNF, typically the nursing facility will uh, is not so excited about hyperbaric oxygen because that would obviously eat up, eat up their daily budget. Um, but I, I, uh, I have um, brochures here, unfortunately, but I also have it on the presentation that I'll load up. But it's, it's, uh, our number is 587-3425. It's hard to remember, but it's been the same number for a few decades. And I'll have it on my presentation. It's on my first slide. So that's the Hyperbaric Treatment Center. You can just, calling is probably the quickest. And then uh, we can also give you a referral form. But, but just call. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I'm, I'm around and happy to answer questions or you can just call me. Thank you.